trader, guide, and pioneering archaeologist Richard Wetherill led the first major expedition into Chaco Canyon in the 1890s. The field supervisor of those excavations wrote, Some of our workmen cleaned out a number of rooms, and in one of these, a great many human bones were found. Some of these, including portions of the skull, were charred, and the majority of the long bones had been cracked open. It would therefore seem that these Pueblo Indians, either through stress of hunger or for religious reasons, had occasionally resorted to the eating of human flesh. In November of 1902, the popular press got hold of the story. Harper's Monthly published an article about early finds and claims of cannibalism. But these stories, along with Wetherill's findings, faded into obscurity, lost to history. Ultimately, Wetherill himself was murdered and buried not far from where he dug in Chaco. Yet to Turner, Wetherill and his colleagues were trailblazers. They had identified cannibalism, they had identified violence. They did not have an explanation, but they got it right. They got it right. And what bothers me, what bothers me is why why is my profession ignoring what these people did? Retracing the footsteps of Wetherill and the archaeologists who followed, Turner confirmed that what they had found among these hills were not just the typical findings of any graveyard. In at least one of every 50 cases, the trail led to murder. And worse. Bodies were dismembered bones broken into fragments. These ancient remains reminded Turner of the way early hunters butchered wild game for consumption. Trying to cut a rib off. Though no butchering expert himself, Turner tested his theory firsthand. I didn't go to school. And the stuff is so tough. <clears throat> Meat is tough to tear apart, okay? It won't come apart. Okay? Now, look at all these fractures. Look at all these little tiny pieces that have come from my hitting this bone. So what do we have here? Look at this. This is what goes into the pot, okay? This is meat processing, okay? They're processing people for the same reason they're processing animals, okay? They're breaking animals open for the same reason. To turn a human into meat is an act so reviled that the charge has provoked many American Indians. Turner's claims strike them as no less than cultural slander. Cannibalism, of course, is a very extreme human behavior. We now have science making all kinds of, of uh, judgment on who was doing what to whom. In the face of many doubts from American Indians and scientists alike, Turner set his standards high. He wanted to develop a rigorous series of forensic indicators that would have to be present before he could claim that the remains had been cut, cooked, and consumed. Now we have, a, we have a minimum of six criteria that have to be present before we will make a, we will draw a conclusion that we have possible cannibalism. Turner's forensic checklist for cannibalism is based on the science of taphonomy. He studies bones that were manipulated at or near the time of death. First off, the parts of the assemblage that we can identify with certainty that are human head parts have burning on the backs of the heads or on the tops of the heads, but never on the face. So the head has been placed on a fire for a length of time that caused the charring and the burning and the damage on the outside, but no damage on the inside. The skull was intact, the brain still inside. In short, it was being roasted, 
prepared for a meal. Brain is nutritious food, rich in calories and high in protein. After the roasting, the heads are broken open to expose the brain. Take the head, place it on an anvil stone, take a hammer stone, and hit it hard and cause the skull to crack open. The cracking results in the skull breaking into a series of pieces. And we know the fracturing occurred at or around the time of death because these breaks are very, very sharp. These are the breaks made when bone is fresh, not yet aged and dried out. Extracting the cooked brain left another clear sign of cannibalism, anvil abrasion, distinctive scraping as bone is smashed between stones. Now those are particularly important because you cannot get anvil abrasions on a bone that is heavily covered with muscle tissue. You must cut the tissue off first. Turner also discovered a pattern of tiny V-shaped grooves etched in bone. These were not caused by erosion, nor were they from the teeth marks of carnivores and scavengers, like the biting of coyotes or the gnawing of rodents. They were sharp, parallel cuts, the marks of stone tools slicing away flesh and muscle, cutting down to the bone. For more than a decade, one man has investigated the use of precisely these kinds of prehistoric tools. Archaeologist Bruce Bradley crafts his own stone blades, or flakes. His work parallels Turner's field demonstrations, but Bradley is a specialist in these tools and their use for butchering game. He experiments firsthand to see if the markings he leaves behind match those left by the old hunters. I'm gonna make another sharp flake here. Bradley works on a butcher shop sheep in place of the wild game that the ancient hunters would have processed. It's the contact we're cutting these connective tissues like these tendons, like this tendon here. They're the tough things. Meat's easy to cut, but these tendons are tough. And you've got a lot of tendons attaching right to the ends of the bone, right at your joints. And that's why you've got to get in there. And you also have, they run underneath, so you can't get at them very easily. You can't see what you're doing. You just sort of got to feel it. Like there, I got between the bone there. A lot of times when butchering, depends on what you want to do with this stuff. Um, if I'm after the marrow, then I need to disarticulate it so I can smash it, clean it and smash it. And I got to get, flex it so that I can get right in where those tendons that go between the bones right inside the joint. Bradley is not investigating cannibalism among the ancients. He is just looking at how hunters left signs of their work on butchered bones. End up having to sort of twist it and pull on it. There we go. Like that. Like a detective interpreting a murder scene, Bradley retraces every step a hunter takes to butcher a carcass. His work is a type of experimental archaeology aimed at discovering the actual techniques ancient people used. Right here you can see the, the cut marks on the bone. And this, this occurred when I was cutting earlier and cut into the end of the bone. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just do that final cutting here, that last little bit. In the end, the marks left on these bones match both ancient animal bones and the human bones that Turner has studied. Even the location of the cut marks themselves match. Most are near the end of the bones by the joints, where tendons hold muscle tight. But cut marks were not the only clues that Turner found in the human assemblages. After the big pieces of flesh had been removed and the long bones of the arms and legs scraped clean, they were put on a stone and shattered. The apparent goal? What was inside the bone, the marrow. One of the primary sources of fat available to those living in the region, bone marrow was a valuable resource. 
and Turner discovered something else in the bones that was significant. The length of these fragments is the same in humans and in game animals. They're breaking the bones up even to the same length. And that was the length of bone that would fit into the ancient cooking pots. The pots themselves created another mark that argued for cannibalism. As the stew was cooked and stirred, the pots left behind a unique trace on the ends of the bones, pot polish. The polishing is due to the bone having been stirred around in the inside of an abrasive cooking vessel, a ceramic vessel where the inside is somewhat like sandpaper. The polishing reflects the light differently than the regular 